quantum. These parameters for life on Earth clearly show evidence of design and purpose. Third, British scientists Boyle and Wood-Rapperson estimated that the chances of life evolving from the random shuffling of organic molecules is virtually zero. They calculated that there was only one chance in 10 to the 20th power to form a single enzyme, and just one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power to produce the approximately 2,000 enzymes that However, oil on the ground point out that the production of enzymes is only one step in the generation of life. Therefore, they concluded that there must be some type of cosmic intelligence to explain the origin of life. Oil compared the probability of life spontaneously generating from life as equivalent to the chances of a tornado randomly producing a Boeing 747 from a junkyard. Four, the cell is the basic unit of life. The DNA molecule of a single-celled animal contains enough gen complex information to fill one volume of an encyclopedia. An explosion in a print shop will never produce one volume of an encyclopedia. That amount of information necessitates an intelligent cause. Fifth, the human brain contains more genetic information and the information found in the world's largest libraries. There is no way that this amount of information could be produced by mere chance. Intelligent intervention is needed. Six, molecular biologist Michael Behe has shown that the irreducible complexity found on the molecular level cannot be explained without appealing to intelligent design. The theistic hypothesis of intelligent Design is more plausible than the atheistic hypothesis of random chance. The existence of absolute moral values. We all make moral value judgments when we call the actions of another person wrong. When we do this, we appeal to a moral law or standard. This moral law originated in the individual, for then we could not call the actions of another person, such as Adolf Hitler, wrong. The moral law is not the creation of each society or culture, for then one society cannot call the actions of another society, such as Nazi Germany, wrong. The moral law doesn't come from a world consensus, where world consensus is often mistaken. The world once thought that the earth was flat, the sun revolved around the earth, and slavery was morally acceptable. Therefore, in order to make sense of our moral experience, there exists a moral law above all individuals, societies, and any world consensus. This absolute moral law must be eternal and unchanging if we are to condemn the actions of the past, i.e. slavery, the Holocaust, etc. The moral law is not des descriptive of the way things are, as is the case with natural laws. Rather, it is prescriptive for it prescribes the way things ought to be. Prescriptive laws need a prescriber. Therefore, a moral lawgiver must exist, and this lawgiver must be eternal and unchanging. The absurdity of life without God. What hope can an atheist offer mankind? People on their deathbeds don't usually call an atheist to comfort them. Normally, a preacher or a priest.
life beyond the grave. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human beings are destined to extinction in the vast of wisdom, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of the universe in ruins. Immediately following that statement, Russell referred to his atheistic philosophy as the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Without God, life is without meaning. However, if there is a God, then there is hope. The God the Bible guarantees the defeat of evil and the triumph of good. He guarantees that Hitler will receive his punishment and Mother Teresa will receive her reward. God gives life meaning for how we choose to live our lives. God is our reason to be optimistic about the future. Only he can overcome our fear of death. Only he can defeat evil. Without God, meaningless existence is all we face. Without God, there is no hope. Evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Christians believe that God has uniquely revealed himself in and through Jesus of Nazareth. Today, most New Testament scholars acknowledge that Jesus acted and spoke as if he believed that he possessed unique divine authority. That he saw in himself the coming of God's kingdom, and that he believed that each person trusted in him. The ultimate vindication of Jesus' message and ministry is his bodily resurrection from the dead. There are several pieces of evidence for Christ's resurrection. First, the resurrection accounts are not legends. The New Testament has more manuscript evidence of its reliability than any other ancient writer. It has more copies, a higher degree of agreement between its copies, and a smaller gap between the oldest existing copy and the date of the original composition. No other ancient writing comes close to the New Testament in manuscript evidence. All New Testament scholars now date the Gospels within the lifetime of eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus, between roughly between 40 and 100 A.D. Some New Testament scholars even date the Synoptic Gospels as early as the 30s to 50s A.D. John Wenham, uh, Jean Carmack, Claude Trismontin. John the entire New Testament was written before 70 A.D. Renowned archaeologist William F. Albright dated the Gospels between 40 and 70 A.D. The majority of the New Testament scholars date most of the New Testament letters from 48 A.D. to 64 A.D. Apostolic fathers were the pupils of the apostles, whom the apostles selected to lead the early church. They wrote between 95 A.D. and 156 A.D., which marks the death of Polycarp, one of the apostle John's pupils. They confirmed the apostolic message that Jesus claimed God and Savior, and bodily rose from the dead. Most researchers of the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived from 37 to 97 AD, believe that Josephus' account of Jesus' resurrection was later amended by Christian copies. Still, the majority of these researchers accept a shorter reading of this passage as authentic. But even if the shorter reading of Josephus uh, even the shorter reading of Josephus acknowledges that the first generation church believed and proclaimed that Jesus had risen from the dead. New Testament scholars almost universally date Paul's first Corinthians at about the mid-50s A.D. Chapter 15 of 1 